Hayek called our economic system a marvel. And we don't have enough awe at the incredible stuff that our economy is able to achieve with no one being in charge. Hi, I'm Russ Roberts. I'm professor of economics at George Mason University and a research scholar at Stanford University's Hoover Institution. And I try to write novels about economics. Not particularly well, but. What I try to do in the book is give people an idea of the forces that create order in our lives without deliberate design. Uh, the virtues of leaving things alone, not just because freedom is good, which it is, but because of what that freedom produces when we are able to choose our own path, choose our own dreams. I use the example of um, uh, bagels on a Sunday morning. When you show up at the bagel store and you decide to throw a brunch at the last minute, there are plenty of bagels waiting for you. You don't have to call ahead. A guy who comes in two hours later doesn't say, where are my bagels? Oh, we gave him that new guy. He threw a bunch brunch. We felt sorry for him. Uh, the guy across town doesn't, ha doesn't get told, oh yeah, all the bagels went to this guy on the other side of town because he wanted to throw a brunch. The profusion of availability in our lives, which is so magnificent, which, is a lot, which allows us to be spontaneous, to dream, to plan, to try new stuff, is just so amazing. Somebody figures out how to uh, use lasers, which seems like a very bad idea for eye surgery, and as a result, we get this incredible thing called LASIK, but at the same time, there are laser tag parlors. The laser tag parlor people weren't told, oh, no, no, you'll have to wait a few years. We're busy devoting resources to lasers. Or if I want to become a great, uh, a fitter person with better diet and better health habits, there's all this food waiting for me. There's special clothes, there's videos, there's trainers, there's fitness centers, it's an amazing thing. But couch potatoes get their stuff too. All this stuff that could create incredible conflict. Oh, people are into fitness. Let's have all the resources go to them. But if you want to just lay around on the couch, too bad. No, everybody gets stuff. The people on the couch, they get new brands of potato chips, new flavors, stuff to help them get fatter and less healthy if that's what they want. The system serves us without anyone designing it. Appreciating that is one, I think, part of being a civilized human being. And two, helps you make uh, better decisions in the voting booth. And occasionally it might help you in else, elsewhere in your life. But just part of what economics has to offer, it's really our deepest insight, and it's been forgotten. So I tried to bring it back in the book and tell it in the form of a, of a novel so that it's a little more interesting. Uh, people are intellectually curious, obviously, about how the world works, who use the economic way of thinking as a useful way to frame the complexity of the world to help you organize your thinking. And of course, uh, teachers and students who are explicitly trying to understand the world are the people I'm trying to uh, touch with this book. But it's, uh, it's for your mom, it's for your uncle. Um, I think understanding how the world works is just part of life. Well, when I write didactic fiction, I'm trying to do two things. I'm trying to deliver an educational message, and I'm trying to do it in a package that's relatively palatable relative to the standard techniques. So I like to say, uh, it, it's not beach reading, but you can read it at the beach, and you could learn something along the way. So what I try to do is take a set of economic lessons and embed them in a fictional story that both entertains, and if it's done well, helps make those lessons more vivid and interesting. When, when you write a book that's called An Economic Romance, which my second book was, and this recent book, The Price of Everything, is, um, has some romantic scenes, uh, people often complain they're not um, hot enough, spicy enough, racy enough, you choose your generational word. Uh, I always say, well, if you can write a sex scene without causing people to giggle, you write that. I can't do that, so I end up writing books that I'm afraid or PG at best. When people say, an economic romance, is there any good parts? I always say, well, I hope the economics are part of the good parts, but don't get, um, don't get too excited. It, it is PG at best. So uh, there's romance, which is nice. Uh, there is, uh, but it's modest. Well, I suppose all novels are didactic. Uh, they all want to teach something, but some are more explicit. Uh, you know, the most successful didactic novel clearly is uh, Atlas Shrugged, although you could argue it's um, Oliver Twist. I mean, Oliver Twist and the work of Dickens was designed to 
touch the heart and get people compassionate about the poor and the current state of British, at the time, British poor laws. So uh, there's, authors often have a lot of different agendas. But what was the one that's done the most damage? Um, beside my own? I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, one tragedy, I think, about Atlas Shrugged that, that makes me very sad is that it is supposedly, in a survey, the second most influential book in people's lives after the Bible. Uh, one wonders then why the United States uh, is not a more libertarian or liberty-oriented place, if that is the case. I think what a lot of people learn from Atlas Shrugged is, is the lesson that it's okay to be happy, which is a good lesson. It's true. It's okay to be happy. I don't think everyone absorbed the economic freedom lessons quite the way that uh, they were intended.